Hey, what's up, YouTube? It's Richie from Boston. It's the 15th. It's July. It's 2019. And I'm putting up this video right now because I recently just read another email, and it was from a subscriber. But I get this all the time, where people are saying, Richie, Jesus wasn't real. The Bible's not real. None of that stuff. It was copied from a Freemason book. So forth, so on, blah, blah, blah. Well, in my lifetime, I've had the opportunity to go to the museum in Boston and actually see the Dead Sea Scrolls in person. And then I also went with somebody that was a translator and I saw the Dead Sea Scrolls with him. I happen to believe in the Bible and I happen to believe in Jesus Christ. And I mean... I don't understand what the issue is. I don't understand why people go after this so much. No, Jesus wasn't real. Here's the deal. Even if everybody was completely and totally wrong, if people lived by the words Jesus Christ put out, we would live in an entirely different world completely. But to explain much better than I can, because I'm not going to pretend where the Bible came from and what the relevance is, this is Chuck Missler. So check this out. Well, welcome to our gathering. But I have a question. How many of you here believe that the Bible is the Word of God? Can I see a show of hands? Well, praise God. That's great. But why? Why do you believe it's the Word of God? You and I glibly cling to that. In fact, we're gambling our eternity on that. But it's interesting. Not everybody believes that. And you're going to need to know why you believe that, because I think dark times are coming. I have an interesting article that was handed to me yesterday. The headline says, The Catholic Church No Longer Swears by Truth of the Bible. The hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church has published a teaching document instructing the faithful that some parts of the Bible are not actually true. The Catholic bishops of England, Wales, and Scotland are warning their five million worshipers, as well as many others, drawn uh, to the study of Scripture, that they should not expect total accuracy from the Bible, and that goes on and on to indicate that some of it's not really true, and it's, 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 it's very useful but not accurate, and on it goes. Very typical of man, many denominational statements, and the Catholic Church, of course, doesn't surprise us on the one hand, and yet this joins the key issue. Is the Bible really true? And that's what we're going to take a look at. How did we get the Bible, and what is it really? Where did the texts of the Bible come from. In the early manuscripts, we have 6,000 copies of the Greek New Testament or portions thereof. I want to contrast that to Homer's Iliad, very venerated among Greek scholars, but we actually have only about six, we have 10 times as many New Testaments, I mean ancient manuscripts, as we have Homer's Iliad. And uh, Euripides' tragedies, uh, even half of that. There's also a lapse period for the classical Greek that virtually 800 to 1,000 years between the time the events presumably happened and the first manuscripts we've got, okay? The lapse of the New Testament works is one lifetime. We have documents that record it from within one lifetime, not several centuries and so on. And I want to talk to you a little bit about P64. It's a papyrus that's now been dated before 66 AD. It's a little scrap that includes Matthew 26, verse 23 and 31. 23 on the one side and the back side. It's, it's written on both sides. And it was within the lifetimes involved. I'll come back to that in a minute. There are a number of papyri that are very important. Uh, and I won't go through each one of these. To simply to say that there's a whole world here of manuscript diligence to dig into. Of these various scraps and things that are dated. Uh, um, all, many of them have been dated like the 2nd, 3rd century or earlier. Um, but uh, each with its various uh, controversies. But there is a document, there's a book that was labeled, a strange title, it's called the Jesus Papyrus. It's an unfortunate label, of course, but in 1994, according to the Times, December 24th of 1994, a papyrus believed to be the oldest extant fragment of the New Testament has been found in the Oxford Library. It provides the first material evidence that the Gospel according to Matthew is an eyewitness account written by contemporaries of Christ. Now, what is this reporting on? A guy by the name of Costin... I'll come to him in a minute. Let's back to the papyrus. This, the so-called Magdalene Greek papyrus, 17th slant, P64, was a segment of Greek text of Matthew's Gospel that uh, here, there are three fragments, 
and they're shown here on both sides, if you will, a total of 24 lines, segment of Matthew 26, verse 23 and 31. The first point about these, first of all, the, this text corresponds to Textus Receptus. We're going to talk more about Textus Receptus, which is the principal undergirding of the King James and the one that's been attacked by the so-called modern translations. I'll come back to that. Getting back to the Nomina Sacra, Matthew, the Matthew 26 fragment uses these abbreviations for both Jesus and Lord, showing the very, very early use of these abbreviations. This indicates that the deity of Jesus was recognized centuries before it was accepted as the official church doctrine at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Clearly, Jesus was recognized as Lord in his lifetime. That's why they crucified him, was his claim to be God. But also the early documents also indicate uh, uh, these things. They weren't the result of a church council as such that was several centuries later on other matters. I want to get to the Alexandrian codices because there are three codices that were that are the source of a lot of confusion. Codex Alexandrinus, it was discovered about 1630, it was brought to England, and it was a 5th century manuscript containing the entire New Testament. The noteworthy thing here, it was a complete Bible. It wasn't just this book or that book, it was a, a comprehensive Bible from the 5th century. In about the 1800s, um, Codex Sinaiticus was found. A German scholar uh, by the name of Tischendorf discovered this in St. Catherine's Monastery at the traditional Mount Sinai. And this manuscript dated about 350 A.D., so again it's 4th century, is one of the two oldest manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. And then there's another one called Codex Vaticanus, which has uh, been in the Vatican Library since at least 1481, the 15th century. It was not made available to scholars until the middle of the 19th century. It was dated slightly earlier than the previous ones, but uh, anyway, these three are regarded as among the oldest manuscripts, complete manuscripts. Now, don't confuse the issue of how old they are with how complete they are. There are fragments that are older than these are. These just happen to be the oldest ones that are complete, you follow me? And uh, they give rise, uh, the, all three of these appear to have had their origins in Alexandria, which is one of the great li uh, libraries in the ancient world. And uh, now these have become very controversial for a number of reasons. Now let's get, get, go through the English Bible and come back to these. John Wycliffe, of course, is the Oxford theologian, uh, most eminent of his day, and he and associates were the first to translate the entire Bible from Latin into English, Wycliffe. And William Tyndale, born in the 50, uh, 1494, uh, in the age of the so-called Renaissance, graduated in 1515 from Oxford. He studied Greek and Hebrew. He committed his life to studying the Bible from its original languages for the common man. You need to realize that these guys did what they did under penalty of death. And uh, Tyndale was uh, lured out of his home and then burned at the stake by his adversaries. You, we need to understand that at times, this was, these were tough times. Here's a rough history of the English Bible. Wycliffe started with us about 1382 from the Latin. In 1525, Erasmus pulled together the best documents available at that time, most of which were from Byzantium and were in Greek. And uh, what he pulled together in 1525 is sometimes summarized as Textus Receptus, the text as it was received. It was the, the official uh, primary uh, basis for subsequent translations. Um, in uh, the following year, Tyndale's Bible, uh, for it was the first English New Testament, followed by Luther's Bible, which is the first one in German. Coverdale was an assistant to Tyndale and finished what Tyndale had started, so he really completed what Tyndale hadn't quite finished by uh, 1535. Again, each one of these are doing all of these things under penalty of death. You need to understand the dominance of the medieval church in those days. Then we have a series of the Matthew Bible from Tyndale's Notes, and then the Great Bible, as it was called, because it was very large and very expensive. <laughs> then the Geneva Bible, the Bishop's Bible, then the douay Reims Bible, which was redrawn from the Latin, basically the Catholic Bible. We finally get to 1611, which codifies these things into what's called commonly the King James Version. And... Uh, James VI of Scotland became the King of England and adopted the name James I, and it was under his 
tutelage that they undertook a authoritative final, so to speak, um, translation. More than 50 scholars, the best they could find, and they had a heavy commitment of prayer at each step of the way, and they formed, uh, they, they, were, they drew upon, they had available to them 5,556 manuscripts. All the things that were available before was at their disposal, but the primary thing they relied on was this collection of Erasmus called Textus Receptus. This document, even to this day, is recognized by most as the noblest monument of English prose. There's none of the modern translations, while they may be more readable and they have some advantages, none of them have the majesty or the veneration of the King James Version. And we'll come back to that in many ways. Let's talk a little bit about Textus Receptus. You see, at the end of the third century, Lucian of Antioch compiled the Greek text to become the primary standard throughout the Byzantine world. Remember, the capital of the world now was in Byzant Byzantium, not Rome. And from the 6th through the 14th century, the majority of New Testament texts were produced in Byzantium and were in Greek, not Latin. And 1525, Erasmus, using five or six of the Byzantine manuscripts, compiled the first Greek text produced on a printing press, and that was the basis for what's called Textus Receptus. Let's go back to Alexandria with his Alexandrian codices. You know, it's interesting, Satan's strategy always has been one of creating doubt. Yea, hath God said. And uh, with additions or amendments or what have you. In 55 AD, the twisting already begins. Second Peter 2 deals with that. You can just put in your notes, in the interest of time, we'll keep moving here. One of the things the Gnostics did is they expurgated the Scriptures. They, they, they would delete things from the Scriptures. They were known for mutilating the Scriptures. In 156 A.D., Irenaeus said of the Gnostics, quote, Wherefore they and their followers have betaken themselves to mutilating the Scriptures, which they themselves have shortened. In other words, I want you to be aware of the fact that one of the practices of the Gnostics was to delete portions of the Scripture. Now these codices, as I've mentioned, these three Alexandrian codices, are the primary reliance of most modern translations. And uh, one of the things that we're going to discover is that in the, in the uh, tides or attitudes of scholarship, um, in the 19th century, more and more, uh, there was a disparagement of Textus Receptus and a veneration of the Alexandrian codices, saying that the Alexandrian codices were the oldest complete manuscript. We'll lean more on them and less on Textus Receptus. That was fashionable up until maybe 10 years ago, and we're going to see what the benefit of that. Textus Receptus begins to get dethroned when Johannes Albert Bengel in the 1730s produced a text that deviated from Textus Receptus, relying on earlier manuscripts. In 1831, Carl Lachman produced a text that represented the 4th century Alexandrian codices. And then Trigellus, who was a self-taught in Latin, Hebrew, and Greek, spent his lifetime publishing a Greek text that came out uh, before the end of the 19th century. But the point is, these Alexandrian codices that uh, uh, emerged, um, uh, while they were presumably actually were codified in the 4th, 5th century, they were discovered in the, in the 16th, 17th century, are beginning to influence the modern translations, the NIV and others. And so the question is, are they really reliable? It has been very fashionable to lean heavily on these codices and less on Texas Receptus, and let's see what the difference are. There are two guys that you'll hear a lot about. There's a guy by the name of Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort, Westcott and Hort. They were Anglican churchmen, and they had contempt for Texas Receptus. And uh, so they began a work in 1853. After 28 years, they spent in a Greek New Testament based on Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, the two of the, the what we re now regard as corrupt manuscripts. They were influenced by Oregon and others who denied the deity of Jesus Christ. They embraced the Gnostic heresies of the period from the headquarters of the Gnostics in Alexandria. There are over 3,000 contradictions in the four Gospels alone between these manuscripts. They changed the traditional Greek in over 8,000 places. Why do we accept the Bible? Because it's authenticated by Jesus Christ. And uh, we first have authenticated Christ because of the detailed specifications He fulfilled. 
and uh, Daniel 70 weeks being the best example, and then having authentic, authentic, authenticated him in our minds, then it's authenticated by Christ in the Torah and elsewhere. That closes the loop, if you will. An integrated design of transcendental origin. origin. 66 books penned by 40 guys over several thousand years. A design that anticipates in detail events before they happen from outside our time domain. And so we have these hidden authentication codes that we've talked about. But how can you tell yourself? Jesus tells you in John 7:17, 7, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. So having tried to at least give us a feeling for where we got our Bible, the next briefing pack you might want to explore is how to study the Bible and how do we deal with these things in ourselves practically.